Do you want to save money at the grocery store, eat more organic, whole foods, cultivate food security, and feel more connected to the earth? If so, then growing your own food is a no-brainer. You wouldn't believe how many people come to me claiming that they can't grow their own food. They think they don't have enough space, that they're too busy, or that they simply don't have what it takes. Perhaps you've fallen for one of these gardening myths. If you think you can't grow food, or if you think the only food that you have access to is what you buy in the grocery store, I have a life-changing webinar that you need to see. It's free and will help you unearth your inner gardener. I've helped thousands of people just like you learn to grow their own food, and I'm speaking from my own experience when I say that with the right knowledge in place, there is no such thing as a black thumb. With this webinar, you can begin making your garden dreams come true and start growing delicious, nutritious food for your family. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to IWantToGarden.com and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Remember, that's GARDEN to 44222 or IWantToGarden.com. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Jake Mace of Longevity Gardens in Tempe to chat about his 10 favorite edible trees for his yard and why wood chips in your garden could be the best thing you could do for it. Jake Mace was born in British Columbia, Canada, and has lived in the Phoenix area since 1993. He attended Arizona State University, go ASU, and currently is a full-time teacher of martial arts, Tai Chi, yoga, fitness, urban gardening, edible landscapes, and golf at various companies and universities in the Phoenix metropolitan area. He also teaches via his successful YouTube channel and online school of martial arts at jakemace.com. Outside of teaching, Jake's real passion is as an advocate for the environment, animals, and people. Jake has been a vegan vegetarian for nearly 15 years and believes in preserving the earth, its resources, and its living inhabitants so that future generations of people can enjoy them as he has. Currently, Jake lives with his wife, Pamela, and their many adopted animals on their edible urban homestead in Tempe, Arizona. Welcome to the show today, Jake. Hey, Greg. Thanks so much for that great intro. It's so nice to be here with you. You bet, man. Today's podcast will be a little different as Jake and I are going to explore two really cool subjects that are close to his heart and his stomach. We're going to talk about your 10 favorite edible trees for your yard and why wood chips could be the best thing to do for your garden. So let's jump in, Jake. So why edible trees in your yard? Let's go there first. Well, you know, I... I joke with my gardening classes that my focus is not to be a good gardener, but it's to grow food at my house. Mm -hmm. And I have to be a good gardener to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I love trees because they last for decades and decades and they produce a lot of high quality food every year. And once they're established, there's little upkeep and you get to enjoy a beautiful tree as well. Plus it can provide shade Mm -hmm. and life for native animals and there's all kinds of other benefits. But the main reason why I grow the trees is for food, for eating them. Right. Well, and that's, you know, that's what I tell people about this all the time. The big reason I love fruit trees in my yard, and I run a huge fruit tree program here in Phoenix, but the reason I love them is because you plant them once and they feed you for year after year after year. Exactly. And hopefully my goal is to have a lot of the trees I'm planting now outlive me. So let's see if I can make that happen. Nice. Nice. And you're a young pup, so that would be a long time. Yeah, I'm 34, so hopefully I got a few, uh, couple hundred-year-old date palms before long. <laughs> there you go. Well, then those could do it. So this list of trees that we're talking about may not necessarily be something that's perfect for your yard if you live in Minnesota, but a lot of them could be, right? Yeah, for sure. Everything that I'm growing here in the Phoenix area, it could be grown elsewhere, but you know, my main 
canvas, if you want to call it that, mm-hmm. is my yard in Phoenix. So I know the Phoenix area very well, but you know, I'm positive that a lot of these trees could work for you elsewhere. Right. Well, let's just start. Uh, the, the first one on your list is the ironwood tree, and that is decisively a desert tree. But tell me about the ironwood tree. Yeah, and in fact, before the Ironwood, um, we get a ton of emails uh, all the time through my website that are from Australia and other hot climates around the world like Phoenix, and Uh people love my YouTube show because it applies to them elsewhere. But the Ironwood tree is the quintessential Arizona desert native tree. And the reason why I always say Ironwood is my number one favorite tree is because you can plant an Ironwood tree, walk away, and the native climate in the Sonoran Desert here will take care of it for you because mm-hmm. it's very hardy and it's native to this area. Nice. The ironwood tree will produce, once it's mature enough, it will produce edible flowers. And those flowers end up growing into like edible pea pods that are kind of like edamame you would get at a sushi restaurant. Mm-hmm. And so quite often when I do, um, I try to hike a few hundred miles every year in, uh, whoa, around whoa, the whoa. southwest. Is that all? Yeah, we did about over 300 miles this year. <laughs> Slacker. And while we're out there, quite often when it's the right season, mm-hmm. I eat the Palo Verde pods and the ironwood pods, wrap right the trees fresh and raw. Nice. Yeah, so the ironwood tree is one that I have a four-year-old ironwood tree that I planted in 2011 mm-hmm. from the Desert Botanical Gardens plant sale. Right. And it was in a one-gallon pot. So think about a little tiny tree, barely a foot tall. Mm-hmm. And now that tree is over 15 feet tall. Wow. And is it producing ironwood beans yet? Uh, this will be the first year that it does. So I've, um, it's, it takes about four or five years from my experience to do that. Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, it's just a beautiful shady oh, no. tree. The ironwood does have a lot of thorns on it, but that's common with a lot of the desert Arizona t- uh, native trees. Right. Now, the one time that I did eat ironwood beans, they were a little bit smaller than a pea. And they had been roasted, dried and roasted, so they were crunchy, almost nut-like. Have you ever tried them that way? No, but I'm going to now. That sounds great. Exactly, exactly. That sounds delicious, yeah. So so you eat them raw? I eat them raw, but hey, I mean, I think the roasted, salted, whatever you want to do to them, I think Mm -hmm. eating the food from your yard, keep it fresh and keep it new and try to find different ways to prepare it. And the ironwood is such a beautiful tree. It almost looks like if God were to ever speak to me through the burning bush, it would be through an ironwood tree. Oh, there you go. There <laughs> you, you know. go. So next on your list is a Barbados cherry. What on earth is a Barbados cherry? Well, so where with the ironwood tree, I never have to water. It's completely drought tolerant and requires uh-huh. no water. The Barbados cherry is not a Phoenix native, but it can take the full Phoenix sun and summer. So it's also called an acerola cherry tree. Mm -hmm. And the acerola powder or acerola cherry is one of the foods that has the highest contents of vitamin C of all foods. And so you can go to a health food store and you can actually purchase acerola uh, vitamin C powder, Mm -hmm. or you can just grow a Barbados cherry tree yourself in your yard. Yeah, I started growing, I have a couple of them growing here. And they seem to do pretty well in the winter here when it gets cold. So it's probably something that could be grown in other climates, yes? Completely. And I don't know why more Phoenix residents don't grow Barbados cherry because mine mine does um, lose a little bit of its leaves in the winter mm-hmm. and it takes the full summer heat. But what happens is that the Barbados cherry is a tropical cherry. And so it doesn't have a pit. It has multiple seeds. Mm-hmm. The cherries are really delicious, especially if you let them ripen until they're fully deep red or purple. And they fruit throughout the entire year. They don't have a nece- They don't necessarily have a season. And so you'll get cherries about eight months out of the year. Nice. The first one I planted was in a three-gallon pot initially, and now it's probably, I would say, higher than 10 feet tall oh and my at gosh. least about 8 to 10 feet wide. Wow. It's kind of like a pomegranate, kind of a bushy type tree. Uh-huh. Wow, fantastic. And I, and I just want to revisit this whole vitamin C thing. What I had read was that the Barbados or Acerola cherry has a thousand times more vitamin C than citrus. Yes, I read the same thing. Wow. If you search anything on online, just search for um, uh, vitamin C or nutrition content of mm-hmm. Ace Roll of Cherry and you'll you'll be super inspired to plant one of these guys. And this this top 10 list I'm giving you guys today of my favorite trees, we're two trees in now with the Ironwood and the Barbados Cherry. These are my favorite 10 trees for producing a lot of food. So 
you can grow a ton of things in the Phoenix here. I have about 250 plus edible trees on my third of an acre in Tempe. Mm-hmm. But these are my 10 that I think produce the most amount of food for your buck. Nice, nice. So the next one on the list is a fig, number three. This probably should be number one because the fig is one of my favorites. Uh-huh. <laughs> and um, I, I, it's amazing. I do these garden workshops here. I bring in Phoenix residents to do um, gardening uh, tours and workshops. And mm-hmm. so many people, probably 80%, never in their life even tasted a fresh fig. Because what I'm finding is that the figs don't have a very long shelf life. You know, once they're oh, off the tree, they right. tend to mold pretty quick. Yep. So that's why you don't see them in stores. Mm-hmm. You know, um, grocery stores are interested in fruit that can keep a long time to protect their bottom line. And so the fig tree is one that home gardeners have to plant because you can plant many different varieties of fig. I have about <clears throat> a half a dozen different varieties, mm-hmm. and they all produce well. They go deciduous in the winter, so they lose their leaves in the winter. So if yeah. you had an area that you wanted to have be sunnier in the winter time, that would be good for a fig. And they grow huge. They can be pruned according to your liking. Mm-hmm. And they produce so much edible fruit, you can dehydrate it and it will keep forever once it's dehydrated. And I would definitely grow more than one so that if the birds take some of them, you don't feel bad. Yeah, grow some go. for the birds and keep some for you. Right. So cool. some of my favorites of the fig, I have a um, a brown turkey fig, I have a green honey fig, I have a Texas blue giant fig, I have a um, a black mission fig, and I have a tiger stripe uh, tiger stripey oh, nice. fig. Nice, and it it actually has stripes, right? It's cool. Yeah, it has stripes. Yeah. Um, it's like a tiger. Fantastic. All right, number four on the list: the fruiting mulberry. <laughs> Man, maybe this should be number one because maybe, maybe <laughs> all these should be number one because they're all so There you good. go. I've been watching a lot of um, gardeners online who are more experienced than me and they all talk about, you know, the best time of year is the mulberry season. Mm-hmm. And the important part is, is that to go out and get a mulberry tree that's a female because not all trees are male, female, but mulberries have males and females. Right. And the males produce the pollen and the females produce the fruits. And so- mm-hmm. A lot of cities don't like people to plant the males because they produce pollen that can make people's allergies act up. Right. But the females are fine. They don't. The female mulberries um, don't affect any allergies, and they produce fruits. And you can have one male mulberry, um, as long as it's within a couple of miles of you, it can it can pollinize you know dozens and dozens and dozens of female trees. So you don't have to have both right. because there's so many males out there. Yeah. Your females will be fine. Well, now I have a Pakistani, a purple Pakistani mulberry in the backyard here at the Urban Farm. Yes. And it makes a mulberry that's oh so incredibly good and about three inches long. Yeah, three inches long. And what do you think of the taste? Oh, it's just extraordinary. Delicious. They're like they're like sugary blackberries. Yeah. Know? Yeah, they really are nice. And so and a lot of people think mulberry and the, the I have a mulberry here on the on the property also. Uh, at the urban farm and it makes a teeny little mulberry and it just it just sweet there's no taste to it mm-hmm. so you have to make sure that you get the right kind of a mulberry yes yeah and i'm i'm with you i think that that long pakistani mulberry is the king yeah it's so good and uh the mulberries too if you go to a store like a premium store like whole foods or aj's or something you know mm-hmm. you'll see mulberries on the shelves that are dehydrated right that are in like the raw vegan trail mix section and they're mm-hmm. like Twelve dollars for six ounces. Wow! So you're talking almost forty dollars a pound. So man, I mean, grow it yourself. And the mulberry tree itself mm-hmm. is basically an enormous weed. It grows oh, so it, fast. Yeah, there's so much. That is so true. So don't put it close to your house because the roots can be a little invasive. So right. put it out in your yard, and put it in an area where you want to have an instant shade tree. Because last year I had a female Peruvian mulberry go mm-hmm. from a one gallon pot, a little tiny one foot tall tree right. to a 12 foot tall tree in the first year. And we're going to talk in, in the second half of the show today, we're going to talk about how you did that. Yes. I have a secret for all your mm-hmm. listeners. Um, yeah. That's a secret they can do for free to supercharge their trees. Yeah, exactly. Great. Number five on the list is the pomelo or grapefruit. Yeah. I kind of lump these in together because grapefruits and pomelos kind of share like a genetic line. You know, they're mm-hmm. kind of like grandchildren of each other. Right. But if if you have a grapefruit tree that's healthy, 
I mean, it's the best time of year because the grapefruits and the other citrus, they tend to stay ripe on the tree for many months in a row. Right. And so where with like a loquat or a, or a fig, once the fruit is ripe, you have a few days to pick it. With the grapefruit or the pomelo, it's a delicious fruit that keeps and stores well. And you can take your time eating them off the tree because they, they stay fresh for a long, long time, many months. Right. And I actually, I think I'm like you, Greg, where the later I wait to eat them, the more sugary and delicious they become. Right. Oh, I've noticed that about my citrus too. And pomelos are rare. So if, you, if you've had a grapefruit before, um, definitely plant a pomelo because they'll, mm-hmm. it'll be a beautiful citrus looking tree like a grapefruit, but the pomelos are more rare and they just taste fantastic. And pomelos are more of a true grapefruit that um, are just pure delight for your taste buds. Right. So what is the distinguishing feature of a pomelo? So they're very when they're ripe, they're very yellow. They they're green when they're unripe, and they're uh, they ripe into a yellow color on the skin. Uh huh. But what I find is the pomelos that I've eaten, the skin is far more thick than a grapefruit. Yep. The flesh you eat on the inside mm-hmm. is usually is usually yellow as well. Where most people eat grapefruits that right. are pink. And so I just find that they're an enormous like um, head sized citrus fruit. That that's one, where I was going with it. They're just enormous. I mean, they're one pomelo will feed you an entire breakfast. I know. Isn't that wild? I mean, they can be bowling ball size. Totally. And yeah. I just went to um, I just went to the president of the um, Arizona Rare Fruit Growers here in town to his house, and he uh-huh. had some mature pomelos he had grown from seed oh 25 years ago. Oh, my gosh. So he had a really cool story, and um, his were purely delicious. Fantastic. Yeah. Plus, what's cool about the pomelos or the grapefruits is that you can graft them. So if you ever want to get into uh, mm, into yes. making Frankenstein trees, they're a great tree to practice with. Perfect. I guess we're at number six now, which is a loquat. Yes, and before I got into gardening, I had no idea what a loquat was until I actually saw your tree, Greg, at the urban farm at your uh-huh. house. Yep. And then I got a chance to um, have a friend at the Desert Botanical Garden. I teach their Tai Chi program, their Tai Chi classes. Uh huh. And she brought me in a couple boxes from her loquat tree of fresh fruit. Nice. And I knew instantly I must plant several of these trees. Now I have about a half a dozen loquat trees. Oh, nice. <laughs> and I just love them. There's different yeah. varieties for those of you who are interested in uh, genetic diversity of trees. I have the Golden Nugget, I have Christmas Loquat, and I have one called the Advance Loquat. Oh, nice. And what I'm finding is that the Loquat is an evergreen in the Phoenix area. It stays green year-round, and it's um, a subtropical that takes the cold extremely well. I never have to cover my I've never Loquat had, trees in the winter. Yeah, I've never had a problem with the cold, so they could be planted elsewhere, I'm sure, as well. And and your tree in your front yard looks beautiful. And how do you oh, like yeah. the blooms when they flower? Oh, it's well, it, it, they've been flowering, interestingly enough, for the past month. And we'll start getting fruit here in the next 30 days, 30, 45 days. Usually by the beginning of April, we're getting fruit off of it. So that's even earlier than, than a peach, uh, a peach ripens. Oh, yeah. Yeah, our peaches don't start ripening until mid-May here. So That's, I think you were you were the one talking to me before. What your one of your goals was to have something ripe at least every month out of the year. Yep, some kind of tree fruit ripe every month and, of the year. And so loquat would fill that early season month. It, it absolutely does. That's awesome. And and loquat is so underrated for taste. The loquat fruit itself is orange and kind of fuzzy, like a yep. peach or an apricot. Right. But the taste is better than those. I think it's just it's a yeah. tropical, delicious, sweet orange fruit is so delicious yeah and it's it's kind of fleshy like an apricot exactly yeah but more juicy i find oh yeah definitely more juicy yeah number seven on the list is the tangerine or cara cara orange and i put these together because i have two mature uh navel orange trees in my front yard that fruit really well Uh uh-huh and i have hundreds of oranges off each one every year oh yeah but that cara cara orange is a rare one. It's like a a ruby kind of reddish pinkish on the inside. Right. And I have a, I have a tangerine tree that I wish I had more of because the tangerine that I have is actually far better tasting than my navel orange tree. So I definitely encourage your, your listeners to plant themselves a tangerine tree. The tree itself is evergreen. It will last for decades and decades if you take care of it. And 
like I said, the fruit is delicious. It'll make you healthy. It comes in its own wrapper. <laughs> I know, isn't that fun? <laughs> so for people like like me who are who are vegan, I've been vegan vegetarian for 15 years, and I try to eat a lot of raw foods. They're already packaged, ready to go. So I have a tangerine right outside my front door. So as I go to teach a class mm -hmm. for yoga or martial arts, I just get out the front door, pick three oranges off the tree, put them in my pocket, and eat them in the car on the way to my class. Nice. I love it. Nice. Number eight. You said here a female carob. Yes. And in, in the Phoenix area, once you – start to become familiar with what the carob tree looks like, you will mm -hmm. start to see them everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. And they grow enormous. My friend Seamus has one of his house that's basically a 50 or 60 foot canopy carob tree. Wow. And they'll live for many, many years, but there are male and female. So it's, it's mm -hmm. tricky to buying a small one because you don't know if it'll be a male or a female. And then the males produce only pollen. The females produce the edible pods and that's what I want. I want the female. I want to kick these males out <laughs> <laughs> because the female carob tree produces a, a pea pod that's enormous and black in color, like blackish brown, mm -hmm. and it tastes like chocolate. No way. Yes. And so if you are ever looking for a chocolate substitute, mm -hmm. like chocolate chip substitute, normally you go and buy carob chips or a carob right. chocolate chip cookie. Right. And that comes from a tree. And so the actual tree can be grown. But the carob tree that I purchased and planted in my yard, mm -hmm. I went to a nursery here in town that already had a female uh, flowering, fruiting carob tree in a box. It was like a 25-gallon box. Nice. And that way I knew it had already flowered. I knew it was female. Because mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to invest five or ten years into a male one than have it just produce flowers. Right. So now I have a female fruiting carob tree on my property that's um, just finishing out its first year in the ground and it mm -hmm. flowered. It's got flowers on it right now for the first time or, nice. or for the second time, for the second time. So then you get the, the, these carobs though, they're pretty hard. What on earth do you do with them? Well, when they're raw and fresh, they're a little more, little more, little more workable. You mm -hmm. can try to eat the flesh out from the inside or you can dry them and then pulverize them in like a Vitamix blender or a coffee grounder and then use the powder for mm -hmm. baking and cooking and chocolate substitutes. Yeah, yeah and it's really nice. And the biggest resource you can you can use is the internet. So go on the internet and type in uses for carob and do that with all your trees and all your plants and you'll find an infinite amount of ideas. I'm finding that people, that gardeners out there, they try to talk to me candidly on the side and they tell me they end up throwing away a lot of their fruit and produce so they don't know how to use it. Mm -hmm. So I would say use the internet and for sure go to my Vegan Athlete YouTube channel. I have a lot of different um, ways you can be creative with your food in your yard. Nice. Nice. And we'll have that link on our show notes page. Perfect. And all the links to my Instagram and YouTube are also at jakemace.com. Perfect. Um, number nine, drum roll, please. This is called a Moringa. And the Moringa just showed up on the, on the scene, what, about three years ago? Yeah. And I planted mine about three years ago. So I'm going to take credit for the Moringa craze. Nice. <laughs> no, Good job, saying. man. I'm with you. But no, I seriously did plant my Moringa trees about three years ago, mm -hmm. and they were seeds. I planted four of them. Two of them I got from uh, a local grower named Suzanne Bellardi. Uh -huh. The other two from a gardening friend. And now I have four uh, Moringa trees that are probably pushing 20 feet tall. Nice. And what do you do with the Moringa? So the entire tree is usable. The leaves are what we are really after because the leaves of the Moringa are an edible green uh -huh. that's healthier than kale and some people say is healthier than wheatgrass juice. Wow. So if you ever go to Jamba Juice and do a shot of wheatgrass, mm -hmm. I, I grow wheatgrass in trays and I juice it here at my house. And wheatgrass, one ounce of wheatgrass juice is equivalent to the nutrition you would find in five pounds of spinach. Wow. And, yeah, and Moringa... The moringa leaves are even more nutrient dense than wheatgrass juice. Mm -hmm. So they call it the multivitamin leaf. It has more calcium than milk, more protein, calorie for calorie, pound for pound than beef, more vitamin C than oranges, more potassium than bananas, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. You can also eat the edible pea pods. And mm -hmm. people in Africa call the moringa a drumstick tree. Mm-hmm. 
because the pea pods in their young state are edible like green beans. And when they get large and mature, they're no longer edible, but you keep them for the seeds. Mm, right. And then some people even say you can shave the bark of the moringa off and use it like aloe vera as an antiseptic. Oh. Oh. But I have yet to do that. I, I just eat the flowers. I eat the, the pea pods, the uh -huh. bean pods, and I eat the leaves. and Give away a lot of seeds. I do. We go through a lot of seeds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, exactly. we give the seeds to local nurseries. We use them ourselves. We sell packs of 25 seeds for $4 at jakemace.com. And we also dehydrate the moringa leaves, mm -hmm. turn them into a powder, and use them as a protein powder for vegan smoothies. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So one of the, the distinguishing things about moringas, though, is they hate the cold and they love the heat. Isn't that the case? I don't think that my moringas even start smiling until it's like 115 outside. I know. Yeah. yeah. They yeah. love it. And and it's no joke. I mean, I have a couple moringas that have a trunk now about almost maybe a two-foot uh, diameter across. Wow. And they were seeds three years ago. So this mm -hmm. is from, from seed to 20-foot tall tree in three years. Nice. They're the, one of the fastest growing trees I've yeah. ever seen. I would say mulberry and moringa. Moringas are right up there, yeah. Are incredibly fast growers. So, and then number 10 on your list is the date palm. Now, honestly, this one maybe should be number one because if you're new to the gardening game and you're trying to create a well thought out edible landscape, uh -huh. I think that date palms should be the first things you plant. And, and here's why, because they kind of become the top canopy and the grandparents of the yard. Oh yes, that makes perfect sense. And so they'll get really tall, um, they can get, uh, 40 or 50 feet tall. I just was with a lady in Arcadia, Arizona, mm -hmm. that lives in a, a neighborhood that has almost 500 uh, black sphinx uh, date, date palms. palms in it. Yeah. And she has a lift that takes us 50 foot up to the top of the canopy, and we ate dates fresh off the tree. Oh, nice. Up. Yeah, we had a video about it on my Vegan Athlete YouTube channel. Nice. And so what she taught me is that if you love, if you love to eat dates mm -hmm. and you eat a date – and you love the taste of that particular date, and you plant the seed of that date, it will not be the same tree. Right. So it's it's really useless to plant the date seed for mm -hmm. the most part. What you're after is find a date tree that you love the taste of, and then hopefully it'll have a baby pup growing at the bottom, and you can right. knock off that pup and plant the pup, and that will be true. It'll be a, a genetic identical tree to the mother. Nice. Um, so we have now um, about 10 female date palm trees here at my Longevity Gardens. Wow, do you really? We have 10, and, and nine of them are female. Mm -hmm. uh, they produce the fruits, and one of them is male. It produces the pollen, and they're all babies, and they're all growing up. So hopefully when I'm still in my 30s, I'll have fruiting date palms. <laughs> And what's cool about it is, is that if you have a bunch of female fruiting date palm trees, uh -huh. And there's at least uh, one male tree in your area, a few right. miles away. Uh -huh. You're fine. It'll that that male can pollinize up to 50 females. Wow. But here's the thing: if you find the pollen of a male, and you break off one of the one of the brooms of pollen off the male tree, uh -huh. and you brush that pollen against the female flowers when the female flowers open, mm -hmm. you'll increase your date production by 10 times. Whoa! Hold on. 10 times. Exactly. I just went to a date palm ranch in Death Valley uh -huh. called the China Date Ranch, and they said that without pollinizing the female flowers, they get about uh, 30 or 40 pounds per tree. Uh -huh. But when they, pollen, when, they br when they brush the male pollen against the female flowers, they get three to 400 pounds wow. per tree. Wow. So imagine, imagine 400 pounds of dates. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> it's almost an obscene amount. I was going to say the nice thing is, is that they save very nicely. They save incredibly well, especially in the freezer. Mm -hmm. And if you're a vegan athlete like me, I can eat like 30 dates a day and yeah. uh, they fuel my entire life. Cool. So I'm going to review real quickly. So this is from one to 10. We have yes. ironwood, Barbados or acerola cherry, fig, fruiting mulberry, pomelo or grapefruit, loquat, tangerine or caracara navel, female carob, moringa and date palm. And Those are my favorite 10 trees if you want to produce some food in your yard. Fantastic. And so when we talked about doing this interview, you said, but Greg, I've got 15. 
<laughs> I got 15, but the other five your list have to go look up on their own. And the other five are Jujube, Starfruit, uh, Neem Tree, Pomegranate Tree, and Banana Palms. Nice. They all work as well, but um, go look those up and uh, you can check out my YouTube videos about them at the Vegan Athlete YouTube channel. So let's move on to this next piece. I put a little teaser in here. Why wood chips in your garden could be the best thing that you could do for it. So let's, let's talk about that. Why wood chips? Why would we want to put wood chips in our garden? Because when I, I have a garden bed and if I have wood chips in my garden bed, things aren't, things don't grow. I've, I've noticed that before. So what's the deal? What's going on here? Yeah, I think you were the first person when I took your class years ago that told me the power of mm -hmm. including wood chips in your landscape. Yeah. This has been reinforced in me so many times since then, the last five years I've been gardening. And for the most part, the number one way I'm convinced that wood chips is the way to go is because when you go into the forest and you see these redwood trees or these incredible pines Pine or trees. whatever else you see, exactly, they're the healthiest, most large, ancient trees you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And what is on the ground? 100% wood chips Yep. in the form of leaves and pine needles and wood chips and bark and fallen trees that are decomposing. Mother Nature gardens veganically. Uh, with plant matter like wood chips. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to emulate nature and the forest here at my yard and it works. Um, when you plant a tree in the ground and you just leave it, it will, it might make it just like a human who smokes might make it to an old age. But mm -hmm. for the most part, if you put one to two or more feet of wood chips on top of that hole around the root system of that tree on top of the soil, It'll do so many beneficial things for the soil and your tree. Did you say feet? Yeah. So there's parts of my yard right now that I have I have over four feet of wood chips piled up where we are we're, we're looking over a seven foot tall fence because my <laughs> landscape has been built up because of the wood chips. We put almost almost two thousand cubic yards of wood chips on my wow. property so far. It's about a third of an acre. Wow, that's incredible. And that's I get them incredible. all for free. Yeah. So we're going to talk about the the how you get them for free. Let's talk about what wood chips actually do for your soil and then how to use them. So let's start with what do they do? All of my information is from my experience. What I've found is that wood chips improve the microbial life in the soil. Mm -hmm. And this is important because we want to create an ecosystem under the ground that helps to feed our trees without us being there. And so there are, there are bugs that we can see like roly polies and worms and earwigs and different kind of bugs that are constantly pooping in the soil and eating the organic matter and they're doing really good things for the tree. The tree then soaks up all the nutrients that those bugs produce. Mm -hmm. But there's also microscopic bugs under the soil that use the wood chips. As the wood chips break down, they use it as their food. Mm -hmm. And as they create their colonies of mycorrhiza and microbes and all this kind of other microscopic you know, life under the soil, the wood chips is their fuel. And as they eat it and break it down, the tree drinks up the nutrients and the byproducts. Perfect. Number so two, the wood chips keep the roots of your tree warm in the winter mm -hmm. and cool in the summer. Because just like when you have your car in the Phoenix area in 120 degree heat, you always put a shade screen in the windshield of your car. Right. The wood chips is the shade screen for the roots of your tree. And in the wintertime, I can keep the roots of my tree 10 or more degrees warmer because of the thick layer of wood chips I have on top of the root system. Nice. Exactly. Number three, wood chips are going to save you water. Because the water will not evaporate as fast, and so you can water your trees less, plus the overall moisture level of your roots will be more consistent. Mm -hmm. So your tree will be healthier because it will have a constant, a constant uh, moisture level that will also drop your water bill sometimes by up to 66%. I've, I've seen my water bill drop two-thirds because of using wood chips. And in the summertime in Phoenix, that's a, a really important thing. Nice. The other thing is, is that wood chips is a constant form of fertilizer. So instead of going out into your yard and adding, you know, chemical fertilizers, wood chips 
is a long-term slow form of fertilizer. So as the, every time, time it rains in my yard, um, that's helping those wood chips break down into organic matter that the tree can use as food. And the other reasons to put wood chips is that after it rains, it smells like the forest in my yard. It's a very <laughs> amazing aroma. Isn't that nice? Um, I don't have any more mud pits because mm -hmm. I used to have a monsoon hit and my clay soil would become a mud pit. Right. And now it's a spongy, really nice feeling, almost like a trampoline kind of feel where it's nice and soft to the touch when you walk on it. And I just, I really love it. I think that it looks so sexy. I think that wood chips mm -hmm. uh, bring a lot of good lookingness to your yard. <laughs> yeah. 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 Let's go back four years. Tell people what your backyard looks like. So my house is very small. I'm in like a 1970s neighborhood, typical neighborhood. Mm -hmm. My front yard's normal. My backyard is huge for some reason. It's like a third of an acre backyard. Uh -huh. And we have a trash alley behind it as well. So it's just a big backyard, but it was totally barren. There were some bougainvillea bushes that have huge thorns and really no nutritional use for bougainvilleas. Uh -huh. And um, just clay, just a big clay lot. I think most people were afraid of the size of the lot. And so that's why my house stayed on the market for so long, unsold. Mm -hmm. But for me, I, I, I wanted the yard. I wanted the land. So my wife said if she can uh, redo some rooms of the house, I can have the yard. <laughs> oh, perfect. And we ended up doing it. And um, I just started uh, planting trees. But when I first started planting trees, I didn't use wood chips. And so for for planting five or 10 trees, I was using a lot of water and the uh -huh. trees were drying out too quickly. Yep. The soil was way too compact and I killed a lot of things. Right. So I would say for your listeners that even if you planted your trees incorrectly with the wrong soil and you feel like you abuse them, mm -hmm. add the wood chips on top because the, the bugs and the microbes will help to bring life to your soil if the wood chips are on top of the ground. Right. And then every season, three or four times a year, just add a little bit more wood chips. It could be it could be leaves, it could be pine needles, wood chips, even your food scraps. Constantly add to it because as it breaks down, you want to add more on there. Right. And Greg, I'm not even kidding you. If you come to my yard now uh -huh. and you dig down into the soil, it's black underneath there. Yeah. Underneath the wood chips is black, just uh, forest humus full of worm castings. Isn't, isn't that nice? I, I actually was going to tell a story. The first time I came to your place had to have been about two years ago, I'm thinking. And it was February and it hadn't rained since November. And I'm standing in the middle of your backyard and I take my boot and I'm starting to dig a hole in, in your backyard, just, you know, like a divot hole. And I get down about three or four inches and it's nice and damp. And I said to you, so how often do you water out here? And you said, I never do. And it was still damp there. And then the other really cool feature of that was the, it was no longer this white clay, dirt it was this like you said nice humus that is uh you know creating itself in the space i think that was that was fun that was a good um yeah. demonstration of the power of the wood chips that that yeah. day and i remember i remember showing that to you and that was in like a common area that wasn't mm -hmm. even by a tree right exactly that was right out in the middle and guess what i've added about two feet more wood chips know, since then that wild <laughs> in that wild so, all right so let's talk about where you get wood chips at and how much they might cost yeah, there's a few things. So there's how do you get them? How much do they cost? And people have all these concerns. Like people are afraid of them because they build up some concerns in their minds. So I'm here to, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to settle those concerns today too. Great. So where do you get them? Okay. Number one way to get wood chips is to be cool. <laughs> hey, you mean like Fonzie cool? Hey. Yeah. Even, even beyond Fonzie. Yeah. <laughs> so the way you get them is you got to be cool because you got to go out there and find local tree companies that are in your area. Uh-huh. Um, I have about four or five tree companies that I've called and talked to in the past that are willing to give me the wood chips after they throw trees into their big truck. Right. They have these big trucks with these huge choppers that chop them up into little pieces. Yep. And they have to pay the dump about $100 or more per load to dump them at the dump. Plus, they got to drive all the way down there and waste gas yeah, and exactly. wait in traffic. Uh -huh. And so what's going to happen is that they are going to be much happier to dump them at your house for free because they'll save a hundred bucks. But they're not going to want to come to your house unless they're already in your area because they don't want to drive across town just for your house. They also want to save time. And they also don't want to drop a partial load. They want to drop the whole load or none at all. 
So you have to be cool right. and be willing to accept an entire truckload, which is not just a, uh, a pickup truck. This is like a landscaping truck. Right. And you have to be, so you have to be willing to take about four or five tons of wood chips in a dump. Mm-hmm. And you got to be willing to, to wait a few days because they might not come right away. They might come five days later or a week later when they're in your area. So I say be cool because if you're a high maintenance wood chip consumer, they're never going to come back to you again. Right. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm really serious about that. Oh, yeah. So well, I, I keep an area in my driveway open so they can just give me a text or a call. Say, they say, hey, Jake, we're in your area. I say, come on by. They dump it on my driveway. Boom, boom. They're off and everybody loves it. Nice. Nice. And now here's, here's a question I get often. Well, what about, you know, are there any bad woods to have in your wood chip? You know, at my, um, <clears throat> I have a Facebook group called the Urban Gardening in Arizona Facebook group. Uh huh. If you guys want to go join it, um, people always ask me that. They go, "Can oleander be in there?" Or, and I say, "Yes." I mean, I have never had anything bad in my wood chip dump. The only thing that I don't like is like I don't like it when there's a bunch of citrus, like a bunch of oranges that are all rotting. Oh yeah. I also don't like it when there's a bunch of stumps. Like if um, if they <laughs> did <laughs> chop up one of the trees and there's a bunch of stumps in there, but that yeah. happens. And you just and have to be cool about it. You got to be cool, man. You got to be yeah. cool. Yeah. So sometimes I'll have to, but for, but for the most part, the the words you want to use with the wood chip companies is you want to say, if you guys ever have a clean load, use that word, clean load. Um, you're welcome to dump it here. You can dump the whole load if it's a clean load, and I'll take it. Perfect. Those and are, um, those are great words. Yeah. Exactly. When one another, so you can look at Craigslist. Um, you can call your local uh, tree chipping company, tree maintenance company. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one thing that happened for me recently is I heard somebody chipping in the neighborhood. So I got real curious and I went out and walked down the end of my driveway and two doors down, they were chipping uh, some trees they were taking out. So I just went and talked to the guys and I said, Hey, what are you doing with that? They said, well, we're taking it to the dump. And I said, you want to dump it in my driveway? And so, you know, I got a, I got a smallish load. There was only about, I guess it's about eight cubic yards, which that's a lot of wood chips, but that's a small load for wood chips. Sure. And, and I used it in the chicken coops and I'm composting with it. And, you know, so that's another way to do it. Just pay attention to what's going on in your neighborhood. I've, I've gotten a few loads that way. That's great. And also for leaves, if you see the landscapers uh, taking bags of leaves, you can stop them and say, hey, can I have those? Great. And um, that's a good point you just made with the chickens. Um, uh-huh. If you add the wood chips into your compost or your chicken runs or your chicken coops, yep. That's a way to eliminate all the smell because the carbon that's in the wood chips tends to neutralize all smell. Yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, I love it. All right, so I'm gonna we're kind of running short on time here, so I'm gonna kind of direct this a little more. So let's talk bugs. I often yes. get the question, "Hey, is this gonna attract a lot of bugs?" I get this question all the time. People are afraid of scorpions. They're afraid of termites, and they want to know, "Is it gonna?" increase my scorpion or my termite civilization in uh-huh. my yard. Right. I've never found that to be the case. Neither have I. I've, I've been in my house for five years. I've seen one scorpion ever. And actually my wife saw it. I didn't even see it. And I've never seen a termite, any evidence of termites. So mm-hmm. I think that there's that saying that if you're in Phoenix, you either have termites or you will get termites at some point. Yeah, exactly. But I have never found any of my gardening friends nor myself has ever found that the termites have become more prevalent with wood chips. I've never found that to yeah, be the case. That's not the case. Exactly. What I find is that actually the wood chips, you know, increase the overall civilization in your mm-hmm. yard. So you actually have a better balance. Exactly. And um, what I've also found is that there are more bugs because like roly polies and worms and earwigs will go to where the trees are. Mm-hmm. But you need that. I mean, that's the whole purpose of putting wood chips down. You're trying to improve the the microscopic and bug civilization, but you want it to be out there in your yard with your trees. Right. And the one thing that I do notice that wood chips does is when I first spread a brand newly dumped pile. Uh huh. So when a fresh pile is delivered to my house and I spread it, um, there are a few flies that come to it initially, but after the wood chips cook down after a few weeks, that tends to settle up. Yeah. And it's not really bad though. No, it's not that bad. It's just, um, um, it's actually there's a lot more benefits. Like the new load of wood chips smells like the forest. My neighbors mm-hmm. actually come out and say, "Oh, this smells so good." Yeah, there you go. And when it rains, it it really does just look and smell beautiful when it rains. Yeah, that is the case. All right, so what, I really enjoy the wood chips. Um, the bugs are never an issue for me. Is there any other any other main questions that people have about wood chips? 
People, people want to know if they have uh, flood irrigation, will they float away when the flood irrigation turns on? I say, nope, that doesn't happen. Hmm. Um, are they okay to spread with pets? And I find, yes, my dogs actually love to run on them. Mm -hmm. Is it too much carbon? I'm just going to go through the list quickly. Is it too much carbon? I find, no, I think that the forest uses wood chips, so why wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. And um, spreading them, you know, the way that I spread them is with my biceps and my hands. <laughs> I just... I get that wheelbarrow out there. I get some friends over, and we uh, we use a pitchfork, a wheelbarrow, and we spread them by hand. Muscle them, baby. And will they blow away in the wind? And I find no, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Sometimes a cat will come in my yard and try to try to try to dig in them, but that's mm -hmm. but that's it. Besides that, I I've only really found wood chips to be a very very positive gardening experience. Fantastic. So, any last thoughts? Greg, I think we covered everything. I think that. Uh, whenever I do a YouTube video, we have about 300 YouTube videos on my Vegan Athlete channel now, and I always end each video saying, please, whoever's watching out there, do two things. Go vegan and grow your food at home. And I think those are very important things. I think yeah. that if you're living today in the world, it's becoming so overpopulated. We've got to start growing our food at home because the roof of our house is an untapped energy source. Use solar panels. Yep. And the front and backyard is an untapped refrigerator. Grow your food. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Jake. How can our listeners get a hold of you? How can they find you? You know, email me all your questions at the jakemace.com email system. I'm very active on Instagram at jakemacetaichi. Uh -huh. And uh, join my Facebook gardening group called Urban Gardening with Jake Mace. Fantastic. Thank you, Jake. And that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Hey, Greg, I love this show and uh, thanks for having me on. You bet. Do you want to save money at the grocery store, eat more organic whole foods, cultivate food security, and feel more connected to the earth? If so, then growing your own food is a no-brainer. You wouldn't believe how many people come to me claiming that they can't grow their own food. They think they don't have enough space, that they're too busy, or that they simply don't have what it takes. Perhaps you've fallen for one of these gardening myths. If you think you can't grow food, or if you think the only food that you have access to is what you buy in the grocery store, I have a life-changing webinar that you need to see. It's free and will help you unearth your inner gardener. I've helped thousands of people just like you learn to grow their own food, and I'm speaking from my own experience when I say that with the right knowledge in place, there is no such thing as a black thumb. With this webinar, you can begin making your garden dreams come true and start growing delicious, nutritious food for your family. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to IWantToGarden.com and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Remember, that's GARDEN to 44222 or IWantToGarden.com. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.